Yeah, so Mohammed, thank you for joining us tonight, and it's a huge pleasure to talk to you. And today we're going to dwell into the ancient mysteries of our long forgotten past and the scripts of our future. And tonight we have an amazing new special guest, chemetologist, hieroglyphics expert, tour guide, and director, Mohammed Ibrahim. And Mohammed Ibrahim is a member of Kemet School of Ancient Mysticism, a professional historian. Inspired by an equally passionate desire to share his wisdom, he offers a wide spectrum of knowledge regarding the history, arts, literature, and culture of ancient Egyptians. Mohammed Ibrahim was born in Memphis, Egypt, and studied ancient Egyptian, Coptic, Islamic art, and uh, history at Helvan University in Cairo. He has been working as a tour guide and a, as a teacher of hieroglyphics. And Mohammed's uh, comprehensive knowledge of ancient Egypt, along with his background in comparative religions and spiritual studies, has enabled him to fill lecture halls and conduct a variety of successful tours over the years. So, Mohammed, thank you once again for joining us tonight. It's a huge pleasure to talk to you and be able to learn from the huge amount of information and wisdom you have. And, you know, we are so very looking forward to this conversation tonight. So maybe at the beginning, you would love to share, you know, how this journey started for you and, you know, where you found that interest in Egypt, in ancient Egypt, and maybe you had some major influences or inspirations that, you know, drew you to the current point you are now. First of all, you are very welcome, Christina, and uh, the pleasure is mine to join the show. Um, you, you mentioned that I was born in Memphis. Yeah. Uh, Memphis, as we know, is the uh, one of the very old capitals of ancient Egypt, and of course, Memphis is very close to Saqqara and Dahshur and Abu Sir. So the beginning was uh, when I was in uh, primary school. Uh, my school took me to uh, a school uh, prep to Saqqara, and this is, was my first contact with the pyramids and the ancient sites. Um, and I saw tourists, and I wanted to like make contact with them, to talk with them, but I couldn't because of the language. But I saw an Egyptian person talking to them in fluent English. So I asked about him. They told me this is the tour guide. And from that time, I remember, I said, I want to be a tour guide like this man. And this is uh, could be the uh, the gate. After high school, I decided to go to the uh, Helwan University where I study Egyptology, hieroglyphs, ancient Egyptian uh, religion, art. Okay, and uh, here I am. I became what I wished. Yeah, that's phenomenal. You just became such a huge professional in the area you are working and you are just putting all your heart into that. And you are um, just trying to be able to make such system for not only professionals to be working, like reading uh, hieroglyphs and all those scriptures, but also such uh, such you know um, common people like us who are not very familiar with you know hieroglyphs. We're also able using your system just to try to do our own investigation and just to to find the symbols and read ourselves. So that's really phenomenal work you do. So thank you once again for for that. And maybe you just uh, can share how that also started for you, how you decided to put all into that one scheme and just to help people to understand the hieroglyphs. You know, uh, that is why, because when I was studying um, uh, the ancient Egyptian language, it was very difficult. And you had to memorize so many uh, samples and letters, and the pronunciation, pronunciation was very difficult. That's why I was trying to find a way how to make it easy. And the fact is, I found it is easy, but the professors made it very difficult. I don't know why it, it, it was because of them or because the subject was very tough. Uh, yeah. But also, it will be um, like uh, honest for me to say that the Egyptian local language now is similar to the ancient Egyptian language, or like a copy of it. Mm -hmm. So that is what enabled me to feel it and to, um, to, to have the idea that I'm not talking different language, I'm not talking dead language. Uh, and also by teaching uh, students, I found or I figured out that, that the best way how to teach this, not because so many people and uh, my colleagues also said the same, that the studying hieroglyphs is like mathematics and physics. Mm. 
something very hard and you need to uh, remember formulas and uh, to understand like um, some connections and, and how to reach this end or this meaning because of that beginning. Okay. Yeah. Um, I told them, no, it's a language. Consider this as a normal language, not like physics, not like very hard subject. Mm -hmm. And this is what happened. Mm -hmm. And um, it's 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 curious because I mean it's it's uh, it's it's a language when we see it written it uh, you know consists of these signs it's not like our alphabet uh, maybe um, uh, you know also for our listeners that are not familiar with this kind of stuff uh, a lot maybe we can start at zero and kind of say what is a hieroglyph what do we what what do we know about it what does the word mean you know just kind of start at like the 101 for hieroglyphs and then we get into the uh, juicy stuff okay if we talk about the language we shall call it the ancient Egyptian language okay and the ancient Egyptian used to call it Medu Nitr and some people explain this as the holy writings or the writings descended from the sky okay so once again we call it ancient Egyptian language so what about what is the, the story of hieroglyphs this is a type of writing like uh, like a shorthand or like um, a font was used. The ancient Egyptian used three fonts. Number one, or the most famous one, is hieroglyphs. And this is the Greek name for what they call it sacred language or, uh, or uh, like um, holy language. Number two, uh, the hieratic, and also Greek name. And that is the... Uh, the font was used by the, uh, the, the priests. And number three is the demotic, which is also Greek name, and that is used by the locals. So what we call it hieroglyphics is the writings we see in full details inside the Egyptian temples, inside the Egyptian tombs. Hieratic, less details. Demotic, something very quick, still have the same structure, but very, very uh, few details, not the same like hieroglyphs. Hmm. And uh, as we uh, learn to understand uh, what this kind of is, you know, there are other um, uh, ancient uh, versions of, uh, you know, how we transport this kind of thought or, or, or call it the language or call it the written uh, uh, language. Um, do you also look at things like cuneiform and uh, do you see if you do any um, similarities or grave differences? and? And how does that work together? Um, okay, I, if I can uh, share the info about this, it, it is not my story, but it is my colleagues that uh, some of the ancient languages, like there is a language called the Ugaridi, I think the Ethiopian language and the Babylonian, and as you said, the Kony form language, and I believe the Sumerian. Mm -hmm. uh, if we compare between so many of the uh, ancient words, we will find that they are uh, repeated in each dictionary with the same meaning and almost the same pronunciation. Uh, there is a famous word um, like the, uh, the African uh, warrior or like guard called Maasai. Have you heard about this word before? Yeah, yeah the Maasai, of course. Okay. The Maasai, okay. So we, we have the same word in uh, ancient Egyptian called Magi. The Magi means uh, like, a, like a bodyguard or like a protector. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in the modern times, we uh, understand that uh, the ancient Egyptian can write a letter, but this can be replaced from place to another. Mm. Okay, like we do have another word called Joba, with the same beginning, Dej, or like, like a heavy uh, G. And in modern Arabic, we call it Suba. So the point is, Dej can be S. So Majai is Masai. So you see how they... Mm -hmm. they mm -hmm. uh, Sounds like Magi, magician. Yeah. Uh, it could be. But, but my point is <laughs> that Masai is Majai, according to the same uh, example, that Juba is Suba. So Dej is, can be replaced with S. So this is clear example that the ancient Egyptian language actually uh, still uh, survive. And the, uh, 
the the main uh, or or the language is very close to the ancient Egyptian is Arabic language, mm-hmm. or what we can call it Middle Eastern languages or like uh, dialects. Okay. Uh, also, many of the English words I found uh, from the ancient Egyptian language, and we do have a friend. Uh, he is a tour guide too. He speaks seven languages, including uh, French, Spanish, Italian, and he made a PhD uh, research that those seven languages are from the ancient Egyptian language. Mm. Yeah. So I believe the ancient languages and the modern languages descended from the ancient Egyptian language. Yeah, which is the you know direct proof you know in the word hieroglyphs itself you know like hieroglyphs is to me sounds like Horus glyphs or hour glyphs like you know for a second hour of the day. So again, it's like time measurement in the present moment. You know all that language and communication in the present moment. So glyphs are in this way becoming immortal, eternal. You know, coming, you know, descending through the ages, through the languages, cultures, like taking different reincarnations. So again, that Horus glyphs of our glyphs. It's kind of interesting. Mohammed, you here? In uh, they, they call the language Mekunic. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we just lost Hello? you for forty seconds. Forty seconds. Okay. Yeah, so my point is that when the Egyptians called their language Midunitr, uh-huh. the, uh, the, the holy language or the language descended from the sky, mm-hmm. it was for everybody. This language was for the whole world, not just for them. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, beautiful. And also another interesting thing is like the reshaping and understanding of sentences were completely, you know, not very similar like we are doing now. So. Like they, they talk, we now just usually say sun rises in the sky, but they try to reshape the sentences like in the sky rises the sun. They put verbs, uh, subjects, abjects, and even objects, you know, all of them together in different type of the of the order. So how can you just maybe elaborate here why they did so and what was the point of that? Exactly. This, actually, I, um, I don't know to say argue or debate with so many people daily on Facebook about uh, the hieroglyphic sentences and what is the meaning because they think about the uh, the uh, western style of grammar yeah yeah but but i'm telling them no we have to look to the egyptian grammar and by the way it is very similar to the arabic grammar and this is, was one of the reasons that i became very good in hieroglyphics because i was very good in arabic grammar okay so uh the uh, Egyptologists uh, who shared in this, like Champillon, like Alan Gardner, uh, most of them, or we can say all of them, have the Western mentality of the language. So if we try to explain this in a very quick way, that the, uh, the sentence of the ancient Egyptian language can be, as you said, uh, shaped in many ways. Number one, what we call it verbial sentence. Uh, in, in English, we say Muhammad goes to school, right? Uh, the, you know, the verbial sentence from the point of view of uh, Middle East, they must put the verb first, not second. Okay, so they must say goes Muhammad to school. That is the, the, the first type of the subject of the sentence. The second type, what we call it nominal sentence without verb, there is no verb at all. And that's why we don't use verb to be. So when we say Muhammad is a tour guide, no, we say Muhammad tour guide without verb to be. Mm -hmm. Uh, There is another type of the sentence starting with uh, a subject and there is a verb can come after the, uh, the subject or sometimes an object. Okay, and as you said, the uh, like to uh, the sun rises in the sky or in the sky the sun rises or in the sky rises the sun Mm -hmm. or rises the sun in the sky we can say it from each or we can start with each word and it makes sense for our our mentality as uh, uh, Egyptian and Arabs the same thing in the Arabic language so we can understand the sentence from any point okay but still have uh, a certain uh, order or also it's not just like um, we, we can put any word next to another and make sense no 
it still have a kind of um, system okay yeah and that is one of the very difficult things happened to the uh, egyptologists when they started to read hieroglyphics how to understand the word order in the egyptian language and believe me that um, so many of the books i read uh, english and french they m- mistranslated so many things but when we read uh, books for the arab uh, or the egyptian uh, egyptologists they put the right because we felt the right sense of the word and the right sense of the sentence yeah yeah it's all about the feeling and also what's interesting that you put all the, those verb subjects in various orders in that ancient language so it also shows that they never had that um primordial and set you know hierarchy to to the sentence so it also just shows that they never had that hierarchy in the the set of minds you know also they were just like equal in that golden age of their culture so they were all equal and just prospering together because they never had you know that lower or or higher you know places in the society you know as we have today like you know so that's maybe also showing in language how they placed you know the sentences and how that could be in the culture too exactly and that is again could be used as an evidence that because it includes all the types all the uh, not only the the type of sentences but also the directions of writings right to left left to right up yeah. to down so that is another evidence that this language is the source of all the languages hmm yeah and is it uh, i have a question is it uh, is it like that that if you see a hieroglyph in a in a different surrounding of different hieroglyphs it can have a completely different meaning no no i, I don't understand say say the question again like say you have you know you have the bird and uh, you see the bird um, surrounded by certain signs and then you see the bird on another stone and it has completely different signs around it will the bird sign uh, have different meanings or uh, uh, how can we see that can it mean something completely ah, different one and the same hieroglyph yes, exactly uh, each symbol in different combination it means something different and each symbol was uh, uh, sometimes a small symbol next to it like a stroke mm-hmm. okay like i will give an example uh, the owl is yeah. uh, alone is letter m like muhammad okay Uh, if i put the owl in um, with with a stroke next to it will be the owl itself the name owl mm-hmm. okay uh, if it comes between two nouns it will be preposition in i n mm-hmm. okay and so many cases like this so yes each symbol is serving different meaning in different word or in different uh, sequence Mm-hmm. and how does that come together with um uh you know, we know that the the language uh didn't really have vowels right like like kemet was uh not spelled with vowels k m t yes mm-hmm. yeah so so how does that and how do you interpret vowels if they're not there uh, that is very good question stephen and again i shall use the uh, arabic language because we don't have vowels also in arabic language that's why when i write muhammad in arabic i write m h m d this is how i write muhammad but we do have what we call it long vowels okay like the name mahmud mahmud is the o here is is a long vowel uh, yeah. rather than muhammad muhammad is quick o so the long vowel shall be written is there an arabic or in hieroglyphic okay that's why we still cannot understand or figure out we say amun ra or imin ra it is amun or imin mm. because we, we we see the constant all the time i m n or a m n but we don't understand it's amun m o m u n or m e n mm. uh so this is something we i believe we will not figure out unless we use uh, another source like the coptic language or mm. the arabic language uh, sometimes i can say i'm sure that this word is written like this or pronounced like this because i can hear it in the coptic language 
with this uh, style or in the yeah. Arabic language with that style. Yeah, I think that's very interesting because that, that could also mean, you know, that it has uh, different ways of interpreting it and different ways of, of uh, you know, uh, of vocalizing it, if you want, like how to how to speak it. I mean, it could then, uh, you know, now you're going up and down, left and right, uh, and, and, and not on one straight thing, um, if you will, it, it, it's, it's, it's unclear and that opens it up for interpretation, which is really, really interesting. I mean, you know, what if you had only eyes uh, at your disposal as, as a vowel, you know, and you, now you do it, uh, play, play the game and, and, and say all the worlds with these vowels and with those vowels and, and see what happens, I guess. Yeah, as I said before, yeah, that language is um, is not dead language, and we must deal with it at this conception, and we must find what is the very close language to it, so we can um, understand something similar to, to the ancient Egyptian. Um, that mentality, the the Eastern mentality, I believe. I, of course, I appreciate what was done by the, the Western Egyptologists. They did a great job, okay? And uh, my favorite book for Alan Gardner, okay? But as I explained that there are some things still need the Western mentality. I'll give you an example that w when we uh, need to write one, they put, they make one stroke, okay? Or, or one thing of, of anything, like one apple, apple with one stroke, okay? Two apples with two strokes three apples, three strokes, like this. But number 10, number 9 is different, number 10 and number 10,000, number uh, 100,000. Okay. In some cases, they uh, give us numbers or things with number 3. So some people said it is like uh, three things. We said no, it is not here number 3. It's a, a symbol of plural. They are talking about many things, mm. not just three things. Because we saw this in many examples, like when we talk about people, they, they give us a, a symbol of a man and a woman and three strokes. So we understand that they are people, but not three men and three women. Okay, Because the Egyptian language, uh, and also similar to Arabic, that they had uh, uh, singular, singular, words and uh, dual words and plural words okay yeah so so this is something to to show that uh, sometimes we have to look deeper than we uh, we see it is not just the, the very uh, easy translation we can find no we can go deeper and there is a mm, Mohammed you here uh-oh. We just think we lost him. Yeah, hello, do you hear us? We, I think Hi. we just dropped you. Yeah, I came back. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the I means uh, verb to see. But yeah. in other cases, it is verb to do. Hmm. How oh. come? Be because we, we found in some uh, meanings, and it, it, to, to put the word see or verb see, it doesn't fit the meaning. But verb to do, it is more functioning or better in the meaning or fit the meaning more than verb to see. Yeah. So we understand that here the I have different meanings, not just one meaning. Yeah, and also another extraordinary thing I just found, you know, watching one of your presentations is about the numbers and it's the same, you know, how they were able to understand the nature and how they just depicted the frog and, you know, laying its eggs, you know, and we only, you know, now studying nature and having all those microscopic, you know, abilities to investigate it deeper, we know that from uh, one, one from one frog lays around 100,000 eggs. So mm -hmm. young frog glyph signifies 100,000 numbers. So could you please elaborate here? And maybe you have some more examples about that, how that, you know, nature correlation was prominent in the glyphs. Uh, actually, I, that is, was a question for me for a long time. How, why they put the shape of uh, the, the frog or the baby frog? Yeah. Uh, I forgot the name of the baby frog. Uh, 
anyway, I will remember. <laughs> so, tadpole. Okay. Tadpole. Exactly. Tadpole. Okay. So it wasn't a complete frog. It is a tadpole. So I tried to search and figure out why why they made it the tadpole. Why not a complete frog? Mm-hmm. Mm. And then I started to search uh, online the tadpole and how many eggs. And I found this interesting info that the the, the frog baby, the uh, female frog is laying 100,000 eggs. Oh. Exactly. And, and mm-hmm. that number is written like this. And I was shocked because here the tadpole is trying, they're trying to exactly, say, Exactly, huh? Mm-hmm. Yeah, look, yeah, look to the, the, to the, to the, the egg or to the young frog. The number is not about the big one. It's about the, the small one, which is 100,000. Yeah. Okay. Amazing. So I always show this to our clients and tell them how mm-hmm. could they uh, count this because part of our explanation is about the uh, lost technology of uh, ancient Egypt. Mm-hmm. Okay. So this is, could be one of the evidences that the Egyptian had uh, very, very um, uh, sophisticated uh, uh, labs and microscopes, maybe computers, and they can understand. Yeah. Many things yeah. and just a, ge- a general knowledge about it and 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 they knew that this knowledge was so uh, profound that they, that that goes into how they communicate and everybody knows okay that's the thing yeah. that does exactly 100,000 so uh, that is a brilliant example yeah. uh, uh, how how the whole world and and how we perceive it and the thought system at a certain height of consciousness and knowledge uh, translates into how we how we communicate and, 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 and from which different angles you can look at it. It's brilliant. Yeah. Another example I use from uh, Sakara tombs, uh, they uh, were big fans of representing the lower level as uh, the sea or the uh, Nile level, water level. And they represent all the creatures under the water, especially fish. And they always represent some kind of fish. Uh, I don't remember the name, unfortunately, in English. But it is always going in an angle. That she's going up uh, to the surface or down with an angle, not straight movement. Mm-hmm. Okay. When I asked uh, some of my friends about this, they said, yes, this fish doesn't uh, sail or move in a straight angle. It is always going in a straight way, it's always going with like 45 uh, degrees angle, okay? And that is because of the shape of the tail. It's it's quite long fish, something like the snake fish, okay? So another example from the the, uh, the Nile life that the ancient Egyptian were great observers to the sky, to the Nile, to uh, their environment. When they represent uh, the animals, they are they made sure to represent every action. You will not see one bird or one shape of a bird, always many uh, actions of the same bird, uh, many actions or many uh, sides of the fish. Okay, about the stars, they also made the same thing. It is not just a very uh, solid simple. No, it is very, very flexible simple. And the good eye shall see this and shall figure out or try to discover the difference between yeah. this this style and that style. Yeah. Also, I just was, you know, watching one of the John Anthony West presentations and he just shared his uh, also finding about the scarab beetle. And, you know, we also have that larva which is residing in the that cocoon, in, you, know, you know, that that white one. And also, if we will look at that also, if we will just... Uh, place one layer out we will also see that that larva looks completely like mummy and also they also just may have been taking the correlations from that scarab beetle as the um, correlation to the awakening and the just waking up from the dead one so also the same I guess I totally agree with this because the the, uh, uh, the scarab is a symbol of resurrection in ancient Egypt Okay. And yes, uh, uh, awakening, and because the resurrection is not necessarily for uh, humans, like uh, from to be dead uh, and then you will be back to life again. No, it could be could be resurrection for consciousness too. 
Um, I wanted to ask. I saw something on your on your Facebook page too, and that reminded me. Uh, we often see the sign that that famous sign of the uh, the hawk, right? Which is uh, uh, Horus or Ra or uh, I guess you explained it better. And and there's so many ways of how that's presented and uh, what these little things mean. Maybe maybe that's a good example where you can uh, elaborate a little bit on on how what that sign means and and how that changes. Ah, uh, yes, I posted, um, I don't remember, yesterday or the day before, mm -hmm. what we call it, Sirik. Sirik is uh, a shape, a geometric shape. Uh, we believe it contains the name of the king. That shape was developed later to become the oval shape. We call it Cartouche. Uh, that, that is also uh, one of the designs contains the name of the king. Okay, so we can say that the first dynasty, the second dynasty, the third, and with the end of the third, beginning of, of the fourth, they had the cartouche, but before this, they had what we call it Sirik. Sirik is like a big rectangular shape with rect small uh, squares inside. Some people, they call it, this is the front shape of the palace of the king, with the pillars and the uh, that uh, square design. So here, uh, above that Sirik, they always represent Horus in, in, a, in a very powerful shape. So that's why we all uh, explain the name as the follower of Horus. So the king represented himself or his name under the power of Horus. Um, to get the power or to convince the people that he got the power of the famous knitter Horus. And that, that's why we uh, understand that this was a, a, a different era or different conception or maybe different philosophy from the uh, previous and from the uh, the following era when Ra became the powerful one. And that's why they created the title Sara, the son of Ra. And uh, they, they uh, like developed the, the simple and that's why the cartouche came to serve this idea, because it's a different example from the Sirik. And later, now, the, the title uh, Neptawi, the Lord of the Two Lands, and so many titles came uh, from the New Kingdom and the late Egyptian time. But they were all serving certain uh, idea, and all came from the priest. And each priest, when they, or like uh, each priesthood, like the priesthood of Horus, the priesthood of Ra, the priesthood of Betah, of Osiris. Uh, when they uh, get the power, they put their own symbols and their own ideas and their own style of art. Yeah. So that is what we uh, see in many, many locations in Egypt. But of course, we cannot deny that the priesthood of Amun was the powerful one. Yeah, that's exactly the, the thing I just wanted to start conversation now and ask you another question is the power of names in ancient Egypt. You know, we also know that it, that played a huge role. We also know about the cartouches and, you know, the significance of that. And also we know that the name was very important in afterlife to keep to, to keep it, to save it. And also what's also interesting that uh, the headdress they wore was called also Nemes. So again, Nemes, names, and that was a royal headdress. And also we know that today we have in court, again, you know, judges wearing also similar headdresses the pharaohs, you know, have been wearing in, in their times. So maybe what can you share about that, you know, name subject and that headdress and how that is correlated to the individuality and to the, why it was so connected to the soul and why it was so important in afterlife and why it, it was able to connect those two worlds together. Oh, okay. That, that is a huge subject, names. <laughs> but the quickly, yeah, what's we can the secret? Say, yeah, <laughs> that, yes, names were too important in ancient Egypt. Mm -hmm. and, and there is a, a story, I will say it quick, that uh, Horus was, um, uh, of course, we, we all know the story of Set and Osiris, and Set killed Osiris, yeah. and then uh, Isis uh, born Horus, and Horus was about to take revenge of his uncle. So it seemed that there was a battle between both, and um, Horus was in a in a weak uh, position. So Isis wanted to help him, but she couldn't. So she wanted Ra to help him, the son, uh, but Ra didn't help him. 
So she made uh, like a plan against Ra that she prepared like a cobra to uh, fight the netter Ra. Mm-hmm. And and I why I say the netter because I don't agree with the people who says that the word netter means god. No, netter means force of nature. So Ra is not the sun god. Ra is the sun. Mm-hmm. Okay? Or the power of the sun or the sample of the sun. So the word nature here doesn't mean god or goddess nature means the, the force of nature mm-hmm. so uh, he was beaten and poisoned so she told him i have the cure but you must tell me your hidden name the unknown name mm-hmm. so i can use the power of this name to help my son okay and this is one of the evidences that Yes, names had very, very strong power. Also, when the ancient Egyptian uh, explained about the human uh, shape or the, the, how do you call it, the human package, if I can call it this, there is the body, they call it ghet or get, and then there is what we call it the, uh, the ba, the spirit, and there is a ka. The ka is also a kind of um, mystic, creature it's in a middle stage between uh, spiritual and physical mm-hmm. okay like half body half spirit that is the car and we have the ah also very uh, strange uh, figure and we have the ren r e n or r n if we don't say the vowel that is the name so the name is a part of this package without the name this person will not be complete. Okay, the, the five uh, uh, aspects of, of this person will be missing, will, something will, will go wrong. That's why when they said that the, the spirit will come back to the tomb, the spirit must recognize the face or like the, the picture of the deceased uh, from the statue or from uh, a picture on the wall, the relief, and the name, they made sure to write the name. They never forgot to write names. Yeah. Names were very, names, this is the eternal ID for the ancient Egyptian, either kings or uh, middle class or even officials or poor people. Yeah. Names yeah. were very, very important. And always names took, again, the, the what we call it religious style. But uh, because I refused to use the word nature as God, so I can call it philosophy style. Names were uh, used to serve uh, a function or an idea. Okay, uh, it wasn't just a name. No, it, it was a name with a meaning. Like uh, we have uh, the famous uh, uh, name in, in Sakara, Bita uh, Hotep. Okay, that is one of the priests from the fifth and the sixth dynasty. Uh, and he has a very beautiful tomb. Bitah hotib. It means bitah is uh, happy or bitah is satisfied or bitah will uh, like uh, will be in harmony. Okay, so that is all messages like this, like the name uh, Nefertiti uh, and the name uh, Im Hotib as an example, the, the engineer Im Hotib. Hmm. It means who comes in peace or sometimes who comes in harmony. Mm. Okay. Very so har- harmony here is not music. No, it is harmony of uh, maybe uh, calculations of yeah. um, uh, formulas or designs. Okay. So as I explained, each name has a certain idea or a certain meaning serving the the mission of uh, that person. Okay. Here we are in Karnak Temple. But this is what we call it the Bitah Temple. And his wife, Sekmet. Bitah and Sekmet and Khunsu or Nefertum. Bitah, Sekmet, Nefertum are the triad of Memphis, my hometown. So I am here to say hello to my relative. Let's go.
So here in this section, you're going to see the cartouche in the top level raised. So we cannot say who is the king. Because here we can find that some of the uh, places or some of the names here are Roman, Greco-Roman names, Greek titles. Like this, the name is Ptolemy. It's B T O L M Y S Batlamis or Batlamius or Ptolemy. And this is Anchejet, he will get life forever. But they're using the lion here. The lion here serving as L. That's what I'm saying. Yes. Said it changed. Exactly. Uh, not only changed, but that is how come the Greeks is going to invent a letter for us? It means that it used to. It existed, okay, but was used a little bit during the ancient Egyptians because of the age of Leo was ended, mm -hmm. okay. Again, empty cartouche, okay. So to say that the place was built by the Greek Romans or the Greeks, that is not right. Because easily I can come and add the names. And as I tell you, it's not necessarily to have writings on the wall. So the temple could be without writings before. And then something strange. Here we found that the inner part was the name Tutmosis III. How we know that he is three? Because the cartouche is saying Tutmosis only. It doesn't say first or second or third. But according to the second name, with the Khibr, with the scarab, can you see it? Yeah. It says Men Khibr Ra. So we understand that this is Tutmosis three. We are approaching her room. Here we are. That statue in front of us is a statue of Bitah, and that is one of the rare statues for Bitah as a sitting statue. He is always standing with that Wasit scepter and the jet pillar and the ankh with the bald head. That's why some people they make jokes and they say bald head, which means wide forehead means smart. So Bitah, according to the mythology, is the husband. But when we say husband, it's not necessarily like our normal wife and husband or marriage. It is the, the companion or the partner. Where is she? Here she is. Segment. If you have light, can you say when I see the eyes? About the headdress. I may uh, disagree with you about uh, making, uh, comparing between the headdress and the judges of France and England in the last 200 years. No, that is very similar to actually the, the hair wigs used by the ancient Egyptians. And the ancient Egyptians were uh, very clear when they said hair wigs means different level of power. Mm -hmm. And some, some of the colors of the hair wigs too can show how important and how uh, high official he is. And uh, the white and the red and the yellow hair wigs were very important in ancient Egypt. And, and if you go to the Egyptian museum one day, you will find that they made statues uh, and sometimes reliefs, carvings, 
with many styles of hair wigs, sometimes African style hair wigs, sometimes like straight hair, uh, hair wigs, curly, uh, short, uh, tall hair, long mm. hair, okay, and different colors. And in the end, they made sure to represent the same person with his real hair. So mm. it's it's hard to say if that maybe meant like, you know, a feminine part. Somebody could say, you know, uh, and I, I know some people make this point that the, uh, they're wearing the wigs because they know it's the goddess, you know, they know it's a feminine power. But, uh, you know, there's short ones, there's, uh, as you said, all kinds of wigs. So uh, uh, that makes it kind of hard um, to to reduce it to that kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, gender play here. What do you think about that? I can only, if I if I agree with this, if we have one style of, of hair wig only. But we have many styles. I can count till maybe 15 styles of hair wigs. So if we talk mm. about the, the feminine power or the the nature power of the feminine, uh, like Hatur as an example, Hatur have always one style of hair. And most of the knitters like this, that uh, uh, long hair above the shoulders, uh, near the breast, okay? So uh, do we have similar style of hair wig like this? I can say no. The, the hair wigs are completely different design. And again, there are so many designs, not just one. Okay. Uh, and that's why maybe I don't agree with this. I agree that they, they use the hair wig to show the power of the person. And that is, if I can give you... Uh, an, an individual power. Individual power, yes. The position. Yeah. You know, in the, uh, in the last uh, 200 years uh, in Middle East and in Turkey... They used to wear the the uh, the fez, the red fez. Okay, they call yeah. it fez. That uh, tube, the red tube above the head. Yeah. We call it tarbush. Okay. That fez, but but it was going in an opposite way uh, from the 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 very high one, the tall one, means lower position, and the shorter one is higher position. So you, when you meet somebody with this kind of fizz above the head, you can immediately recognize he is high official or junior official or what, what, what is his power, okay. high or low. So I believe that in ancient Egypt was the same example. From the type of the hair or the hair wig, we can understand his uh, level. Yeah, also very interesting that today in our society we have also, you know, even the scientists can prove that, that we have the extensions of the nervous system in our hairs. And, you know, usually people who are more, uh, you know, into nature or more sensitive, they have longer hair. And also, you know, people into spirituality usually have longer hair than those who, for example, we mm -hmm. have examples of people going to military, they have all their heads shaved and they are just losing that connection with nature. So maybe could that be also just the one of the reasons of, of the different styles of those wigs and maybe different frequencies of energies? That could be. That, that is interesting information. Yeah, perfectly makes sense. But the, the word nemes, which is, as you explained, the head dress of the uh, king, mm -hmm. nobody else, only the king. Yeah. Okay. That is why when I said I disagree in the beginning, yes, because no one else can mm -hmm. have this dress except the king. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Also, you, t you talked about the cobra symbology and, you know, about that, you know, how how Isis just got the name from the from the from the Netera and, and was able to save his her son. And also what's interesting that only um, that cobra, we, you know, which bite, you know, the rod was the cobra made from his own body, so to speak. So, again, interesting that only he himself can, you know, hurt himself. And also we have the correlation in the biblical mythology, which is also lots of people say that it's really just descended from the Egyptian mythology too. So we again that have that serpent in the in the Garden of Eden on the on the tree of knowledge and of good and evil. So again the same and only that you know serpent can um, help us to experience that you know what is good, what is bad. Again only because we are able to to you know communicate with that. Yes. 
and and sometimes as you said yes sir, you you can have um, either bad or good effect from your own self yeah okay. yeah what is uh, um, what is the egyptian word for hair or sign for hair hair club the uh, the ancient egyptian word for hair is shenu or could be sheni again the uh, the problem with the vowel but we understand that the two consonant is sh and n uh-huh could be shenu okay. or sheni that's 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 uh, interesting because uh, when you look at the word hair you know it um, and just look at the uh, listen to the phonics um, it, it sounds like her, you know, like uh, female. And you say she knew, there's a she in there, you know, sh, like, uh, which also kind of, uh, you know, long hair is usually worn by, by women. You know, I'm trying just to make this connection with the uh, words here. Mm -hmm. Kind of uh, I want to explain something. Okay. Mm -hmm. I am big fan of um, comparing between the words and try the, uh, to find the similarities. But uh, still, uh, like sometimes, I don't feel like uh, very good is to like um, how to say it, like to do this with every subject or with every yeah, word. Yeah, yeah. Because I, yeah, in many cases agree. that each word has any. Yeah. Okay, sorry about that. Yeah. Now that um, I, yeah, it's it's just a different angle of looking at it. You know, uh, we really try to look uh, from every angle, and uh, you know. Uh, invite you in your specialty field and so many other people and 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 uh, also look just from the phonics and uh, all this together makes a makes a picture that is that is so cool uh, and, and gives a really round view of the, of these subjects so uh, I completely with agree I, it's, it's I sometimes agree. not easy yeah. Yeah. I agree with you completely yes. and and yes uh, if we don't open the uh, the gate for uh, questions like this and for imagination we want to be able to understand uh, deeper than maybe one one millimeter mm -hmm. uh, deeper than what we can see exactly just not scratch the surface but really get to shine the light from all the angles and get to the bottom of it <laughs> sure yeah also, we saw you did the huge investigation in the Australian glyphs. You know, people found the on the on the walls the the Egyptian glyphs in Australia. And also, as far as we know, you uh, and Yosef did the and Patricia too did the investigation, and you found out that that was supposedly the burial place for the sailors who you know experienced shipwreck. And also, maybe you had some chance to to investigate near that space, and maybe you found some bones or maybe there are some investigations that are going to happen in the future investigating that place uh, uh, actually dealing with Gosford the glyphs yeah. was a, a great challenge uh, when Patricia received uh, the pictures Patricia actually uh, traveled to the, the site I think uh, 2012 before that uh, someone sent her the, uh, the pictures and asking her to give her opinion, are these looks real or fake or what? And Patricia sent it to me and Yusuf. Mm -hmm. From the first moment, I said it is real. Okay. Uh, but I wanted to be sure because someone is asking about my professional uh, opinion. Okay. So um, I decided not only say I feel it is real, but I decided to give them explanation. A story about this. Um, it was very difficult for me and Yusuf, uh, but we actually said to each other, we shall not look for any info. It was our first time to know that there is a place called Gosford in Australia and it has such writings. We yeah. didn't know anything about the place or the, the story before. So we decided not to look for any information. Let's deal with the writings only. Okay, so we cannot be uh, uh, affected by any other stories or any other people. And this is what happened. Both of us worked it individually. 
and and the strange thing that we came up with the same end the same result yeah okay so we figure out um, the story and we figure out who wrote this with whom and uh, the names and actually after we translated this we give us the, the right to uh, find out what they are saying about the, the glyphs and we figure out that so many people uh, maybe that most of them are saying it's a hoax yeah. it is not true and I felt very very sad about this because all the weak points uh, we found that it doesn't make any sense someone claimed uh, it is not authentic because it, it doesn't give us any meanings Mohammed, you're here I think we lost you again do you hear us I said, how come? There are meanings. We. Oh, hold on, hold on. Okay. Yeah. What about, are you here? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. now we can hear you. Okay. Better. Yeah, so I, um, I found that some people, they say, claim that uh, it is not authentic because it doesn't make sense and there is no meaning. It's just a punch of samples. And we prove that uh, there are words and there are sentences, complete sentences, mm. and it makes sense. And uh, we found one word from six letters, okay, which is considered as a big word uh, from ancient Egyptian dictionary. And then we discovered some samples. Uh, those samples didn't uh, appear to the Egyptian language before what we call it the late time uh, or the Greco-Roman time of ancient Egypt. That's why we managed to date the writings. And of course, we found that the, uh, the title Sailor is written. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the other title, Chief of Sailors. The We're just losing you again. It's written. So we know that there are two can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, sorry, I told you I'm here with uh, 10 million Egyptian at Alexandria. So it is difficult. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, Yusuf is a stonemason and he managed to recognize that the, uh, the two walls of that valley, the writings on the two walls are different hands. Not the same person wrote the, the two sides. One wrote... The, the left side and another one wrote the second, uh, the, the right side. Mm -hmm. So, and because we found the two names, so we can easily say, yes, the, the sailor and his captain uh, wrote the, uh, the text. Okay. Another thing, and I posted today, uh, also another people, uh, other people said it's a hoax because the name Kofu is written. Listen to this. This is uh, exclusive to this broadcast, uh, we found the name Kofu and the name Senefro. Okay. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 And everybody said it doesn't make sense. How come he is Kofu and Senefro and we never hear it or we have any um, uh, evidences or any stories? Oh, breaking up, breaking up. Hold on, you're breaking up. You're breaking up. Breaking up. Hello? In in Hello? my videos, me and Yusuf and Hello? Patricia on YouTube. Hey, do you hear Hello? us? That's okay. Yeah. Hello, Stefan. I you hear have, you. You have to say it again. You have to say it again. You broke up. Okay. I say it. I will say it again. Uh, I say that they found the name Kofu and Senefru listed on the wall and everybody said how come Kofu and Senefru it doesn't make sense so me and Yusuf said it, it seems to be that uh, such trips to Australia started from the time of Kofu or Senefru mm -hmm. so their names became like labels and maybe the harbor was called Kofu and Senefru okay wow. uh, today uh, the Egyptian uh, new museum the Grand Museum is making like uh, 
a, a, a quick exception for the first time for some papyrus for from the time of King Khufu found on a, on the shore of the Red Sea from a, an ancient port called Wadi El Garf port the most ancient port in the whole world hmm. so if we can connect between this port and Australia and the, the name Kofu in Australia, so we can say easily that from that port, which maybe was done or made by uh, Kofu, the Egyptian uh, sailors or the Egyptian uh, ships used to go to Australia. Wow. Wow, oh, yeah. <laughs> Just rewrite complete all, all the history we have now. And we are very confident about the uh, authenticity of this because some of the samples, even me, I couldn't recognize and I couldn't find the meaning of the samples. Okay. And I thought this is the biggest problem. How come I can't recognize the samples? I, I, I'm sure they are ancient Egyptians. I am sure they are right samples, not fake samples. Yeah. But I couldn't, I couldn't recognize the sample. One of the uh, tours, I found the symbol on uh, what we call it Greco-Roman temple, which is not, by the way, but the so-called Greco-Roman temple in Komombo. Okay. I found the symbol I'm looking for, but I still couldn't uh, figure out the meaning. Then I posted that symbol in one of the groups with my colleagues. We call it hieroglyphic lovers. And I told them, my friends, do you recognize the symbol? Immediately they said, yes, we do. So mm -hmm. I said, how come I can't recognize? They said, because that is Greco-Roman time. They said the symbol was uh, developed from another symbol, and that was developed uh, around 500 BC from the Egyptian civilization. And my studies was what we can call it uh, middle uh, uh, middle kingdom hieroglyphs something like old English and new English okay mm -hmm. that's why I couldn't uh, understand or I couldn't find the symbol in my dictionary it's because I had to find the dictionary of that era because I didn't study that era I studied the eras before I studied old kingdom middle kingdom new kingdom which is, by the way, is great job. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I didn't continue, and my colleagues, some of them, they studied only that era, the uh, the late uh, time and the Greek Roman. So they told me that symbol means with, like W I T H. Okay, so I, when I put the meaning. It, it makes sense. Now I have another evidence. I can date the writings. Wow. That with this symbol, the writings cannot be before 500 BC. It must be that time or after. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we actually, we finished a big section. Okay. M not half yet, but let's consider we have a story now. And we figure mm. out the story that the Egyptians were dealing with the Australians. And it seems to be like... Uh, they were like uh, buying and exchanging goods and uh, yeah. some stuff. And then they were going back home and a kind of very strong uh, storm happened, winds and waves, maybe like a tsunami. So they had to return back to the, uh, to the boat and uh, they lost most of the ships, were destroyed. And the survivors were the sailor and the captain. And what I didn't... Uh, actually uh, uh, share or um, put at the video because I didn't know about it yet the priest we found the name of the priest joining uh, that expedition mm -hmm. okay wow so we, we promise people that in the near future we will go to Australia and um, see the place and we try to feel it personally yeah. and we will finish Finish. All the translation. We will finish all of the translation. Right. 
Yes. You're breaking up a little bit, but uh, I understood as far as, uh, you know, now you have the tools to put it together and make a complete story out of it. Um, Hello. 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 Can you hear us? Here you yes, are. I do. Yeah, I just dropped. So it, we kind of lost you when you said you were, uh, you now have the tools kind of to, to go finish uh, interpretation and, and, and start to make a real story from it. Mm-hmm. Hello. Mohammed. Oh. Do you hear us? I can't even type to our conversation because I type letters and I see it's like, you know, see, circling. 